So welcome everybody, uh, welcome at this presentation. Today I want to tell you something about robot soccer. And to start with, I want to tell you something about our dream, the dream of 2050. So for a moment I want to take you there to that moment, to 2050. You're not here in a conference room, you're actually very close to a soccer field. Imagine this is the soccer field, I actually brought a robot, so it Looks like a soccer field, of course. But you're, you're all very happy, of course, because you're very close to the field. You're going to watch one of the greatest matches in history. It's going to be a match between humanoid robots and the world champion. The world champion, the human world champion. And it's actually a very interesting match. It's, a very, it's very exciting, until the last minute. But in the end, and this will be the first time in history, and you were all there, you saw a team of autonomous humanoid robots win from the human world champion. Well, that's our dream. And I was speaking about our, who are we? We are the RoboCup Federation. We are an international organization of researchers that all have a specific focus. We work on robots that play autonomous soccer. We want to realize this dream of 2050. Actually, what do we do? We focus on artificial intelligence and we want to promote this. We want to promote robotics. And of course, what better way to do that with a game of soccer? So we do that uh, with different robots in a lot of different leagues. I have to tell you this up front. So on the left, you see the small size league, these are really small robots, and they focus mainly on strategy. In the middle, you see a familiar robot, it's actually one of ours, we play in the middle size league, the name explains it all, I guess. And on the right, you actually see a team of now robots uh, playing in the standard platform league, and that's actually where they really focus on walking, running, kicking a ball with a humanoid robot, and that, this picture almost sums everything you need for autonomous robot soccer. So what does the RoboCup Federation do aside from that? They organize a world championship and a lot of different other events all around the world. An example is, for example, the world championship we just had. It was in Leipzig in Germany. And actually, it was a quite good world championship, as I can tell, as I'm a member of Tech United. And actually, we became the world champion in middle size league of 2016. To actually give you already a bit of a flavor, of course, you see our, us here standing and yelling. This was just after we made our last goal. Uh, let me show you a quick video on how it actually looks. How it actually looks if some of these robots are moving on a field. So we have a normal kickoff. And actually in this case you can see that the cyan robots, so the ones with the cyan marker, are ours, just like the one here. The ones with magenta markers are the Chinese team water. And they actually always, uh, we face them a lot in the finals of the World Championship. This is a beautiful goal, if I may say myself. <laughs> The match was really interesting. As you can see, I put it on the right. There was a 3-3 score after regular time. And as you can see, the teams are really uh, making it quite tense. So actually, after a while, we actually came to a situation which never happened before in RoboCup. And I think we'll see it after this beautiful goal. This is a penalty series, which actually never <laughs> happened. And well, our robot, we started off with five Chinese penalties. None of them went in, and we actually needed only one. And then, of course, we were quite happy. And then you see that suddenly, like seven days of hard work, or actually a whole year, of course, but seven days without 
particular without little sleep and without too much programming. And then suddenly you're very happy, of course, because you're the next world champion. So who are we? Again, who are we? So we are Tech United. You can recognize us. We all have the same ideas about fashion, as you can tell maybe by the t-shirts. Uh, we are a team of 15 human players, and we have five field players, one goalkeeper, and one thing which we call, we usually call it the beast, but this time we call it prototype. It's actually a different platform. And this team actually plays on the world championships in the MSL. Tech United also consists of another team, which is uh, more focused on uh, uh, situations at home, but I will come back to that later. So for the moment, remember Tech United consists of two teams. This is only the MSL team, which you see over here. So this is one of our turtles, as we call them, Tech United RoboCup Team Limited Editions. So this is the robot we use to play autonomous soccer. So as I told you before, the humanoid robots, which we'll have hopefully in 2050 beating the world champion, have to do a lot, have to possess a lot of skill. So we've tried to put most of those skills already in these robots. So how did we do that? We actually have an Omnivision unit, which is here at the top of the robot. And it's actually a camera, which is looking up into a parabolic mirror. And with that, the robot can actually see everything around it, but only on the floor. And actually, if the ball, if I would take the ball and I would lift it up in the air, at this point, he wouldn't see the ball because he's looking into the mirror and then down again. That's why we actually implemented a Kinect version 2 sensor. As you might know, this sensor is not uh, sold for a very long time, so we actually got our hands on it this year, and we actually used it for the first time at the World Championship this year. So what it actually does, it's here in this uh, black bar you see at the front of the robot, and it actually helps if we want to track high balls in front of the robot. Of course, this Omnivision unit gives you a 360 degrees view of the field, which is, of course, great. Imagine you uh, would be a field player yourself, and you could also see what's happening uh, right behind you. That would be great. With the Kinect, we actually have also depth, so we can actually see a ball coming way better than uh, with the Omnivision unit. So those two sensors are mainly used to perceive the state of the game. So what's going on? That's really important in soccer. What's going on on the field? What's the current state of the game? Where is the ball? Where are my peers? Where is the opponent? Where am I? Which is also a really interesting question, of course. So these sensors make sure we have a really good view about the state of the game. This state of the game is actually created by an embedded computer, which is on there. Of course, you can imagine. I don't know if you just saw it on the screen, but these robots also collide. That's also why we have yellow and red cards. So this embedded computer, of course, has to be sturdy and robust. Um, just to make sure if we crash into another robot, we don't get lost. Uh, another fun fact, we have an active ball handling system, which is actually what you see uh, here in the front. These two levers, and they actually sit on top of the ball, and they have small wheels. Why do they have small wheels? We need to roll the ball in a natural way over the field. So we cannot grasp the ball and move it like uh, just like this over the field, but we have to roll it. So what we actually did is on the end of those levers, there's a wheel, which is actually like rolling the ball with the robot. Um, aside from that, we have a solenoid, a big electromagnet inside the robot, which is used to kick the ball. You can actually see it if you look here up the screen, there is a small uh, pin, which will actually hit the ball at a very high speed. Then we can actually shoot the ball up to 12 meters a second, which is quite quick, and hopefully it can pass the keeper, and then the keeper will say, I didn't even see a ball until I saw it behind me. That's usually what we aim for. Then we also have a holonomic base, which is actually a base with omni wheels, and that actually means that we are very agile on the field. Our robots can move at any moment. They can move to the right, to the left, they can move to the front, they can actually turn and do any combination of the above. So the best thing is, in combination with this active ball handling system, we can actually 
be as agile as we can move, we can also dribble. Unfortunately, I cannot show you now with the ball handling system enabled, but you can see for yourself tomorrow, uh, we'll present at the Meet the Speakers and the Robot in the foyer downstairs, and we can actually show you that we are very agile. We can just carry the robot around, and the robot will move the ball with it in any direction we want. Maybe some of you got a question at this moment, why on earth are you building robots that play soccer? Why are you not saving the world, for example? Well, we have some particular reasons for that. First of all, we're not only aiming for these robots that play soccer. As I told you, Tech United also consists of a different team. This is actually the at-home team, which actually has two robots which are more general purpose. So you can actually see the white one over here. That's Amigo, and this one on the left, it's Sergio. I can tell you the rest of the team is human, so maybe some of you were wondering. There are two robots in the picture. And these robots are built to function in a home. So I actually have a short movie of that as well. So here you'll see mostly Amigo performing at the RoboCup 2014. And in this case, you already see a lot of difference. There is no RoboCup field, or at least there's no soccer field in this way. And the robot is just picking stuff. It has to follow people, so it should be able that there is like a person walking through the view. On a, I can tell you on a RoboCup field, you should not do that. It could, should be able to interact with people, so it has speech recognition, but it, it can also speak for itself. It can get into a conversation. As you can see, it, pick, it can pick up stuff and bring it back to the uh, operator who requested the object. So let's see. Aside from those caring robots, those general purpose robots, we also have the rescue robots. Uh, that's a whole different league of the RoboCup. And these are actually building robots that are able to go into like buildings that collapsed or environments which are very uh, hazardous, uh, difficult to drive through. And this is actually, um, oh, this is actually uh, something they already used in some crash sites. I think it was in Japan when a nuclear reactor uh, broke. That's actually where they already used these robots. Um, of course, why do we play soccer? Well, I think I only have to show you this video to make you understand the answer to this question. This was in Eindhoven, our home base. We, I can say we have quite some fans over there. So not only we went crazy, but in this case, also the audience went crazy. You have to imagine, in Germany it was maybe a little bit more exciting, but this is only five seconds before the end of the regular time. We scored 2-2 at that point. So everybody was already on the edge of their seat, and then we made the 2-2. So at that moment, a lot of uh, energy comes free in the whole stadium. Oh, let me see. And of course, one of the most important things is enthusing young people for robotics. And that's actually what the whole team thinks is great. When we are at playing soccer and there are so many children looking enthusiastically at what we are doing, we are hoping that we are inspiring them in becoming maybe also a robotics engineer or doing something mechanical. So those are like the intermediate goals of RoboCup. So we're playing soccer to develop technologies in, for example, perceiving the state of the game, general purpose robots, and that all to promote research for robotics and artificial intelligence. I want to thank you for your attention right now. I think thank we're you, you all. You have, let's give him a hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are, you're not done yet. You're not done no, yet. You're part of the panel. I'd like to invite the rest of the panel to come up to talk about the future of uh, robotics. Um, so Jan and Dan and Greg, please uh, come up and sit at the panel. And uh, please uh, submit your questions as you uh, see fit. We have one here while uh, the oh. panel is, uh, is sitting down. 
So uh, the question goes around the uh, interconnectivity between your robots. Are they sending information to each other or are they uh, acting independently of each other? No, in this case, the robots are uh, really uh, communicating uh, via Wi-Fi. Of course, that's really important. Uh, soccer is a team play game, just like we humans. Also, robots is really important to make sure that they are communicating with them. There's only one striker. There is only a, uh, we have two defenders actually, one striker, another attacker, a goalkeeper, and they all have to be communicating to make sure they are not interfering with each other. And also, what's another thing? We're researching multi-agent systems, with which we actually use the fact that we have multiple robots to actually improve the state of the game we have. So for example, if this robot doesn't know that the ball, for example, is around that corner, but there is another robot which can see the ball actually, they will communicate such that they together create a complete world model. And that's actually the two main Excellent. functions. Perfect, yeah, thanks a lot. Question. Have yeah. a seat and um, I'll try to moderate this and need good questions as well. I'll start by uh, asking the panelists just to address maybe in a, in a couple of minutes when we say the future of robotics and we think about the robotics theme as uh, sort of everything included, I guess, what comes, what comes to mind? You know, what's, what's your point of view of the future of uh, robotics from your uh, area of expertise? I want to start out with Dan. Uh, so uh, I am a complete interloper on this panel. I don't have an area of expertise. Uh, I just sat near the front because I can hear better from here. <laughs> um, so... What do I think? I, I was at the keynote this morning and my brain was going <laughs> It does feel like we're on the verge of uh, the fourth industrial revolution. You know, so we've had industrial, then we've had um, technology, um, and now, now we're getting into like machine learning and robotics. And I see those things as very much interlinked. It's not just um, you know, deep learning and machine learning. It's it's also building the devices that can respond. So we're talking about um, so in his talk this morning, he was talking about uh, feedback loops that used to take uh, days, or you know, coming down to minutes, coming down to numbers of milliseconds, so that to uh, airborne cre uh, machines can bounce a ball to each other and, and sustain that because they can they, they, they can keep the feedback going that quickly. So at that point, suddenly, like, you know, I sort of see this incredible world opening up that I can't even begin to imagine. And I know it sounds like hyperbole, but I honestly, I don't know where we'll be in 20 years. And right. I love that I don't know where we'll be in 20 years. All right. Thanks, uh, Greg. Uh, who actually comes from Universal Ro Robots as the lead software guy. A few words from you on the future of robotics as you see it. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest things that we're going to be seeing is the interconnectivity. Uh, I think a lot of these robots are going to be connected up, uh, connected to the cloud. Um, I, I think they're going to be passing information uh, to each other to improve the overall automation. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think that we're going to be beginning to, to see the blurring of the lines between uh, the robotics and, and, and what the humans actually do. So. Thank you. Jan? Yeah, uh, as Dan, I'm also um, totally not an expert on this field, but I, I do have some wishes. And um, the wish is that all these uh, robotics, uh, and I've seen a lot of uh, videos on YouTube because I had to prepare for this panel discussion. And, and there's, um, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of like, uh, it, it seems there's a lot of um, technical stuff, robots and things driving around and toys but all not very useful at the moment. It's, um, it's very exciting, um, but um, I think uh, what I would like to look more into is how can you take use of it, like practical use, maybe in your home, because if what you have is your home, then you would like to have some help in your home. And maybe start with something that, okay, let's have something basic you would like to have it to do for you. And this is what I'm thinking about when I'm looking at all these things and possibilities. So use them as a tool to integrate and, and take use of it. Very good. Ulta, do you have any thoughts on what's your dream come through on robotics for the future? Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. I also heard the, industrial, the fourth industrial revolution, but I think it's maybe even a revolution which is far bigger than that, or at least that's what I hope will happen. 
uh, it will not be only industrial, or it, it, that's what I hope, of course. I hope that robots like Amigo and Sergio and maybe also these turtles will just become normal in our daily lives. Maybe at some point we'll not be watch, only watching human soccer, but also robotic soccer. I think that we are on the verge of something really big is happening. There's a lot of change at the moment. And of course, I can also cannot perfectly predict where this is going. But I don't think robots will only be in the industry alone anymore. They will also be in our homes, uh, entertainment. Uh, I also think, for example, drone racing is a really interesting uh, topic at the moment. And it's also growing very rapidly. So I for sure hope that these uh, things, like also entertainment at home, they will just uh, expand like crazy. Very good. I have a quick question here from, uh, from the audience. So, um, software inherits human errors in the form of bugs. Uh, how is the human error shown in robotics? <laughs> Maybe that's error. also for... Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we don't like human uh, errors. Uh, and you can imagine, it's actually really funny. Uh, I, I was just talking... Uh, uh, we, we actually had a question from another RoboCup team, we as Tech United, um, because we were improving... Uh, uh, our software a lot. If you see Tech United during a world championship, we're always a team which is programming during the, uh, in between games and then uploading the next software. We, we touch a lot of code during such a tournament. And of course, there are human errors. Most of the times we try to decouple as much as possible our software to make sure that not the entire robot starts uh, st like um, stalls, but uh, for example, segmentation faults or something. We do test, of course, during tournaments. But most of the times we try with decoupling, try to make sure that if there is a human error, it's not the whole robot stalling, but just like this small part. Very good. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Any smart questions? Yeah, we got one right here. So one thing I'm wondering about a lot is uh, as we keep automating more stuff and adding robots in as one part of our uh, daily lives and infrastructure, uh, security becomes uh, even more important than it already is because what if a hacker takes down some important infrastructure or, or something like that and how, how would you say that we should, or how, how should we look at security in all this, because in my mind, we're exposing a hell of a lot of uh, what we do normally now, or going down this route. So I've got an opinion about this. I would say I think security is the, the presenting symptom, if you like. What we should be thinking about is securability. So um, as with anything, your your security profile is it's you have to bake that right in. So it, it, it's it's a, it has to be front of mind all the way through. Like testability, you can't make something testable after the fact. You can't make something securable after the fact. So um, a lot of what I'm seeing, and again as a layman, right? So I'm not I'm not deep into it like these guys. Um, what a lot of what I'm seeing as a layman is that makes me feel a bit safer about that. Is the the, the overarching kind of architectural style is small, discrete, cooperating units, which means um, essentially hacking a unit is a fairly isolated affair. Now, where it gets interesting is hacking the channels by which they communicate. Um, and so then you're talking about, uh, um, you know, a security model needs to be around securing the datagram rather than the channel, as it were. So I need to know that the messages I'm receiving from the other players, let's take it to the soccer, um, hasn't been injected as a, as a toxic message from some of the other players, because I don't know if that's not allowed, but, you know, <laughs> if I can... Allowed. No. If I, oh, it's not allowed. That's a shame, because... Yeah. <laughs> Actually, on Because the... <laughs> that would be a fantastic hack, is to start <laughs> getting the other players to run around in circles. <laughs> but, you know, if you... If, so, so, so I think having things like really simple, basic crypto that we've already got, like signing messages, like uh, um, having good sources of messages, and then a lot of the distributed technologies that are coming out around things like um, uh, Byzantine general problems and that kind of thing. So, so uh, how do I know whether some or any of my agents have been intercepted or been corrupted or been replaced? Um, 
So we've already, we're already developing protocols in general distributed systems. So I think as long as we can make these little autonomous units reasonably isolated and, and build securability in from the ground up, I think we've got a pretty good story. If we don't, we're in for a world of hurt. Thanks. Any other thoughts on the security matter from the panel? Yeah, well, what I would like to say, the challenge or uh, adding to the robot soccer will be a good one indeed. <laughs> it will be a nice <laughs> one. Also to prepare, of course. But I do share the opinion, uh, I think, of Dan. In this case, I think you can uh, see it quite decoupled in this sense that security, of course, uh, it's very important, but it's also a matter which is tackled in way uh, different fields. It would be possible to merge these, for example, uh, cybersecurity with robot security, and indeed with the methods Dan already suggested. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Did we have a question over here? I think I saw a question. No? Oh, down there. He waited till you'd gone right over the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> he has a history of troublemaking. <laughs> you don't know me, Greg. <laughs> So I was wondering, the, uh, the turtles, when they are playing, how do they distinguish between friends and foes, or friendly players? Or yeah. yeah, that's actually a really interesting one, because um, in the tournament, I think none of the teams use the fact that each team has a distinctive color. So in this case, you see our cyan markers. We also have magenta markers. But when we play a game, there's, it's only cyan versus magenta. You could use, of course, vision software to extract that Cyan are my peers and Magenta uh, are um, opponents, but we don't do that. What we do instead is that we have one robot uh, uh, seeing black boxes all over the field, and black boxes in this case represent robots, but they're classified as objects uh, or obstacles in this case, something you just cannot drive over or through. And what we do with the software, they're actually, so they're constantly communicating with each other and they also communicate where they are. So if, I, if this turtle sees a black spot over there and the black spot is communicating that someone is there, a peer robot is there, then you'll know at that point there is a peer robot. If that black spot is not communicating, we assume it's an opponent. So that's how that works. Very good. We actually have a lot of uh, really interesting questions coming in here. So, uh, a, a couple of uh, naughty ones too, by the way. Thank you for those. Um, <laughs> what about the code that takes decisions about human lives? Like a self-driving car that we recently heard about in the news, I think. Uh, um, can choose to run over a child or kill the driver. How do we as de software developers handle this? Great dilemma. Who dare to uh, put the nose into that one? You totally kill the driver for being an idiot and buying a self-driving car. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I think it's it's a big question. Jan, are you do you uh, dare to give an answer or give your thoughts? Yeah, um, I'm actually very amazed how this uh, self-driving capabilities of the cars uh, kind of uh, were creeping in. Um, I take if I want to make a car and I want to have it. Um, uh, certified to be able to drive the street is a huge in investment and it needs to be tested and everything. But with the, uh, the self-driving cars, they could just from one version of the software to the next, all of a sudden they could self-drive. And I think it was never tested by any authority or anything. I think maybe the authorities were just like puzzled um, that, oh, okay, maybe someone allowed this and it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> and it seems like that's how it happened, but I don't know. Uh, if anyone knows better, but uh, of course now there are some some you know opinions that uh, uh, what what are the risk, and on the other hand maybe um, we can all figure out that the self-driving car can probably drive more safely than people using the mobile phones or doing other stupid things while they drive. So it's really um, it's really a tricky one, but I think at least there should be a debate before mm -hmm. having these capabilities, and I think there there were not. Dan, anything to add to that one? I mean, I think anything like this, it's an ethical dilemma. It's you know, the, the, the one thing that, that a machine can't do is, is reason in that way. It needs to be programmed to reason in that way. So um, at some point, someone is making a decision about policy. Now, we, we've already got that decision kind of encoded in 
things like um, uh, in the UK you have uh, this, the, the regular driving speed limit in a, in a town is 30 miles an hour. We have 20 mile an hour zones uh, in built up areas or near schools, those kind of things. So there's already um, the, the kind of cues there, if you like, to drive more carefully in higher, higher risk or higher sensitivity areas. Um, I guess the difference between a self-driving car and a driver is the self-driving car will bother taking heed of those warnings. So I think in general they're likely to drive more safely and, and obey the rules. Um, it's, it's really hard. I think in any situation you've got to ask yourself not sort of what's the least worst thing to do, but had a human been at the wheel, would there have been a different outcome? And, and I suspect the... If, if there is a policy and we've all agreed what that policy is, that policy is far more likely to be enacted in that split second by a machine than it is by a person. So, yeah, I don't know how I feel about it. I, I, I sort of think I feel safer that machines will be doing it. Yeah, good, good thoughts. Next one, I think, goes to uh, Greg. So, uh, it goes around lawnmowers and vacuum cleaners are robots that are already moved uh, into my home. Where's the next practical area of robotics? Not toys or visionary dreams. <laughs> uh, one of the interesting things that I've been seeing lately is uh, the application of, of inside restaurants. Uh, I know McDonald's has been looking at trying to uh, automate. Uh, so instead of actually going and, and asking someone to, to make you a hamburger, it would be a robot that would actually be going through the process. Um, and then the people that are there are really just managing and making sure that the products uh, are available to the robots. Um, there's that one, and I also saw something that was kind of interesting. Uh, uh, I mentioned it in my talk around uh, uh, sewing. So there was a, a robot that was capable of, of creating a, a T-shirt, sewing it. And uh, normally in the past, because of the, uh, the flimsiness of the material, it just wasn't really capable, but they found some application that they could stiffen the material and be able to, to create uh, a t-shirt. Um, so I think we're going to start seeing a lot of uh, new industries in which the uh, robotics will start to appear. Great. We are, there's a follow-up question to the Universal Robots uh, side of safety. How do you guys handle safety? I know you guys have non-caved uh, robots, but mm -hmm. so how is uh, safety handled? Um, yeah, I think a general question around safety. <laughs> Very carefully. Um, so the way we handle it at the moment is we've, we've uh, baked in a, a safety system. So you can go in and you can, you can specify some of the restrictions that, uh, uh, that are going to be applied to the robot. And if the robot tries to go beyond any sort of these, uh, these restrictions, um, it would just shut down. Uh, but I have a feeling that going into the future is probably going to change a little bit. A lot of new technologies are starting to be uh, to be designed that allow you to sense the world around you, and I have a feeling that we'll start seeing some some of these new technologies creeping in, and therefore you won't have to go in and actually specify anything in regards to, okay, the robot can't go beyond this particular wall, but instead, if there's someone standing there, it just knows not to go there. Um, one of the limits that I think that we tend to see at the moment is this. Uh, the deterministic approach of, of how we program robots, at least when it comes to automation. This, of course, is not deterministic at all. Uh, we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know how it's going to react when the ball's in front of it. Um, but when it comes to automation, that's, that's kind of a requirement. Uh, people expect it. If it did a particular behavior once, we expect that it's going to continue to, the, to do that behavior over and over again. Um, but that might actually start to change especially when we start uh, uh, moving into like big data and such. All right. So going back to uh, Eindhoven uh, Tech, right? So there's a lot of questions coming in about your soccer team. Nice. So uh, um, I'll just rattle off a couple of them. So do these robots learn from matching experiences? We, we actually talked about that at the oh, beginning. So matching, matching experiences or other matches or okay. other uh, patterns. Yeah, the and do you give you a few, two more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how do they know who the referee is? And um, <laughs> what type of sensors? Are they listening to noise? Uh, what type of sensors are they equipped with? 
Yeah, so, so that was three questions. The, the, <laughs> the first one. Uh, so at least let me start with the referee because that uh, fits more more in the story I just told. So actually, I was telling that every black box is an obstacle. We cannot drive over it. So actually, if there is a black obstacle which is not communicating back, we'll actually see it as an opponent. At this point, it's actually quite an actual topic in RoboCup, I can say, or at least in our league. So the referee will also be a black box, and it's definitely not communicating via Wi-Fi, at least I didn't see a referee doing that. So the robot will just think it's an opponent, and that's actually um, something that will not happen, hopefully, in uh, RoboCup, is that the referee will go into the field. And in this case, we have a human referee, which will always be on the line of the field, or just behind it, and from there he will referee the game. So usually we just say, well, if there's a, an opponent, or in this case an obstacle, moving on the side of the field, we just say it's not there. So in this case, that also shows that these robots, they are acting in a very dynamic environment, but the whole environment has to be specified. That's, of course, something different than the general purpose robots like Amigo and Sergio. Uh, let me see, the other one about sensors. So there are actually a lot of sensors. Most uh, important, of course, are the cameras. So the Omnivision uh, camera on top, the Kinect camera. Um, let me see what other sensors do we have. Of course, there are all the motors. So from the uh, base, the drive base itself, and the ball handling, there are motors with encoders. So we can actually do local feedback loops. Um, uh, and also the position of for the kicking lever and the um, position of the electromagnet, we can measure them for local feedback. At this moment, we're working with those because these are uh, events that happen in such a small time. So we're, we're currently working on doing feedback on those as well. Uh, but I think those were most of the sensors. Oh, we also use a compass because there's, that's actually also another interesting thing. If you look at a soccer field, of course, it's symmetric. So. For these robots to know at which side of the field they are, we use a compass to determine if they're on the north or south side or east or west or something to uh, handle the symmetry of the field. Uh, and then the third question was, I think the first one you mentioned, what was it again? I think you answered most of them, so uh, thank you for that. That's <laughs> very good. <laughs> I want to try to go to uh, a couple of uh, these really big questions, ethical questions that are hard to answer because Jörn likes that type of stuff. <laughs> so, in this morning's second keynote, uh, Raffaello spoke about uh, how feedback uh, from connected systems increased the risk of unusual events. And there's actually a whole series of questions around this. How do we mitigate the risk of these unusual events where robots um, actually become a, a dangerous thing to the human species? And how should we handle it? What's, what's your thought on that whole uh, risk and concern? you have any thoughts on that, Jorn? <clears throat> Not really. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, for, um, I think with the, with the security, I think it's important that you don't uh, collect, um, I mean, too much data in, in one place. Like you have uh, all the keys and, and all the information for one type of system in, in, on one server. Um, I think that should be, you know, isolated and distributed as much as possible. And whenever you collect the data, it's kind of like anonym, uh, anonym data that you can just um, calculate to create new knowledge. Um, I think that will um, make things much safer. Where uh, if a robot can go crazy, um, I think it's important that you have, uh, as in every other system, a reliable system to shut it down in various ways. Um, so these, these um, uh, things should have been built into other kind of machines. Uh, I think it's important to have them here as well. So Very good. Yeah, Dan? Yeah, I think that, I mean, there, there's two axes to this. There's likelihood and there's impact. So one of the things Raffaello is talking about is when you change the system dynamics, so you have these two apparently stable systems, when they interact in a weird way, when you strongly link their feedback, you, you can create a, an overall unstable system. Um, and you're talking about the fat tail um, of, of events. So what that's saying is that there are particular outlier, like really unlikely events that become a lot more likely. 
um, you can still do a lot to minimize the impact of those really unlikely events, even when they do occur. So I think part of it is a, a kind of conscientiousness, a duty of care when you're designing um, the behavior of these things, whatever they might be doing, that if they get some really, really out there signal or really, really out there data, oh, you know, I, I appear to be flying through the air and I'm a ground-based robot, um, <laughs> then, you know, maybe something happened and I'm flying through the air. And so what should I do in that case? And should I just shut down because then at least when I land, I'm just a lump of metal? Or should I, should I, you know, fire off a bunch of sensors that are designed to make me land safely and roll even though I was designed, designed to be ground-based? So I think there's, there's a lot you can do to... Uh, and we do this anyway. I mean, this is how we build resilient systems is we design for um, if we get some really, really out there data, really, really out there feedback to say some really strange things happening, even though, you know, it's the, it's the classic comment in a finally block that says this cannot happen. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're in the block that says this cannot happen, for heaven's sake, do something because <laughs> it just did. Yeah. And, and it's the same sort of thing. So I think if we design for uh, expect the unexpectable um, and do something reasonably sane, even in that case, I think you can cover an awful lot of those edge cases. It's just evolution. It's evolution. <laughs> Very good. We are coming up to, uh, to the closing here, but uh, maybe uh, going through uh, the panel one by one, um, regarding the question on sort of what can the software industry or software people give to the robotics industry, or is it all one and the same? Or how do you see software and robotics sort of coexisting, creating new bigger things? Final comments and we'll end. I think it's really emerged. Also, if I look at our team, we're, uh, most of us, we are mechanical engineers. So we are really into the systems and control side on this. And I think that's, of course, uh, more like the low level of robotics, the lower levels of robotics. So actuation and stuff. And there, I think it's really important also to know always the software aspects of, uh, for example, motion control loops. For, uh, you shouldn't be making any blocking calls in the motion control of these units. That would be uh, really stupid. Um, but <laughs> looking at the higher levels, also there, I think software is, uh, is, a, is really interesting, especially now when robots, for example, are c connecting to clouds, to servers, to uh, databases, uh, Google's uh, TensorFlow, uh, all those things. Uh, I think it will be even more merged uh, the software industry and robotics than before. Right. You want some final thoughts? Yeah, um, and this, this is exactly, I think, why we're sitting here today and, and why at um, our conferences we have uh, more and more um, IoT robotics and, and uh, uh, in the mix, because I think in these years everything comes together and we have these very capable uh, devices that can do a lot of things, but uh, um, there will be you know, regular um, software engineers who knows about uh, the back end, the front end usability, stuff like that, to kind of uh, make bigger systems out of these um, many parts. And so I, th I see the next 10 years really interesting in this field where we cook it all together in some useful appliances and not just impressive stuff. Thanks, and uh, for those of you who were not here for Greg's talk, maybe for the audience, uh, a, a quick recap that you were actually the first software guy inside Universal Rope Robotics, which personally I find amazing, mm. um, but um, what, what are your thoughts on what software <laughs> can offer the robotics industry? Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, <clears throat> it is true, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I actually do see that there's going to be this, this, this hybrid of uh, different, different uh, competencies, uh, not just a mechanical and electronic, but... Uh, uh, also the software engineers, and of course there's other competencies that, that start to come into the picture of, uh, of course, needing the testers and, and the UX designers and everything else. So, uh. Dan? So yeah, so Douglas Adams has a lovely uh, quote, a lovely distinction. He says, anything that's invented before you're 15 has always been there. Anything <laughs> that's invented between the ages of 15 and 35 is amazing and cool. And anything that's invented after you're 35 is unnatural and needs to be stopped. And so I'm in, my, I'm in my late 40s, and, and all this robotics and deep learning stuff is happening around me. I'm not interesting, right? People who are 15 now are interesting. 
because they're going to grow up in a world where this stuff is just normal and where you know, uh, people in their 20s and 30s now grew up with commodity programming languages. People 20 years older than that didn't. Everything was proprietary and everything was bespoke. Um, most people in this room are using open source just out of, out of course, just because they do. Uh, so the next generation is going to come through with uh, commodity hardware, commodity robotics, commodity uh, deep learning capabilities. And oh my goodness, what those guys are going to cook up is going to be quite remarkable. Right? I'm really excited about that. So you know, for me, I need to up my game as a software guy and, and start. I think the, 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 the huge shift, and it is a huge shift, is as a software person to start thinking about the materiality of things and the physicality of things um, and the physics and, you know, and, and those kind of things. And I think generally that's, that's likely to make me a better developer. Uh, but I think it is, it's genuine. It's a thing that you need to choose to go and invest a bunch of time in, in figuring out because this is happening and it is going to be as profound as people are saying. Very cool. So, uh, Walter, back to you for the closing comments since you started out our... Uh, the day. So, um, will these robots win over humans in 2050? For real? Do you think that's going to happen? These robots, they aren't going to win. Because we, I think humans, uh, they are quite good at soccer. And that's why I think we need something which looks quite similar. So, these robots are not going to win, these turtles. But I think when we're merging all the different leagues we have in RoboCup, I'm sure they will win. And uh, I actually have a couple of interesting comments in here about the fear of Skynet, and I think you addressed it, <laughs> you addressed it also in your presentation on how you are trying to bridge the fear uh, with uh, general population, right? So, are you afraid of Skynet? No. No, I think in, the, in these robots, they actually really show what robotics can also be. And I think that's what we also hope to show people that robotics can also be fun and can be entertaining. So, so with fun and entertaining, I think that's the final word. Uh, please give the <laughs> panel a hand.